All right, welcome back class. Here we are, lecture 21, continuing our discussion of critical phenomena, the universality of phase transitions and a specific emphasis on Ising's model of magnetization. We've come to a, a pretty important point where we've convinced ourselves that the Ising model is worth studying. It has the basic physics of a magnetization transition and through its isomorphism with a lattice gas model, it has the physics of a liquid vapor transition as well. It can in principle be used to understand universality and spontaneous symmetry breaking. But now we're to the point where having convinced ourselves of those things that this is useful to study, we need to figure out ways of studying it, ways of understanding where critical exponents come from, which is made difficult by the fact that we can't solve its partition function exactly. You know, real towering figures in statistical mechanics like Lars Onsager were able to do this exactly in two dimensions. But even if you're very, very, very clever, no one's been able yet to solve it in three dimensions. So we need methods, we need physically motivated approximations that can serve to uncover that behavior in lieu of being able to solve it exactly. One of those that we've already discussed, so-called mean field theory, have we've seen breaks down because it neglects some important aspects of a phase transition or a system near a critical point. So we're gonna, one of the things we'll do today after we review mean field theory and what we've learned thus far is to think about those missing pieces, the remaining parts of uh, the partition function neglected in mean field theory by formulating it in a more systematic way, will motivate what those corrections will look like first through a discussion of correlations and fluctuations and, and then using this formalism, we'll, we'll see that unfortunately, adding those corrections in in any simple way is not going to help things. It's not going to give back our three dimensional results, even though we will find by the end of this lecture that we do recover an understanding of why mean field theory works so well in high dimensions. So those are the things on track for today. So to get started, let's remind ourselves of some of the things we've learned from mean field theory and what it is. In a statement of its successes and failures. So first mean field theory envisions our Ising model, which interacts with its nearest neighbors in addition to an external field. It says that, well, maybe what I should do is I should think about some single tagged spin, focusing on it, I can replace that fluctuating environment that biases it to be up or down by just whatever the neighbors are doing on average. So we replace an effective fluctuating external field that fluctuates due to the change of state of the neighboring spins and replace it with just a number that conveys what they do on average. So that seems sensible enough. And you know, if, if I can neglect the fluctuations around that typical behavior, maybe that this will, this will be a good theory. 
And indeed, some of the nice things that we learned is that while simple-minded, it still does predict spontaneous symmetry, symmetry breaking. However, the temperature it predicts for the location of the critical point is Jz over Kb, namely even for a one-dimensional lattice where Z would be two, it predicts a finite temperature critical point. We know that that's not quite right. It, if, as we will, as we did last time, we noted what the values of the critical temperatures are. It does get better for higher dimensions, but it still is quantitatively wrong. So those are some pluses and minuses. It doesn't really have a non-trivial dimensionality dependence, but it's, it does predict that, it, that a transition does exist. So that's something. We last time computed the temperature dependence of that spontaneous symmetry breaking of the order parameter of magnetization, the magnetic moment, which above TC we found to be zero and below TC we found to be something finite and dependent on temperature. And it did so even with a power law relationship with the temperature relative to the critical temperature. However, that critical exponent beta in mean field theory was completely lacking in any dimensionality dependence. It was just one half. Not being dissuade, we also computed the susceptibility or how the average magnetization changed with applied field and found that it too was successfully predicted to diverge with a critical exponent, but that critical exponent was found to be one. Again, lacking dimensionality and uh, uh, dimensionality dependence and not exactly what we would hope for for a one dimension uh, for a three dimensional system like we actually care about. So all of this is to emphasize some basic points, which is that dimensionality is important. And mean field theory does not describe this correctly. This is most quantifiable by noting how the critical exponents like beta and gamma depend on dimension. One dimension, there's no transition. Two dimensions, Ansager tells us these are what they are. Three dimensions, empirically, we've established those exponents. And what is rather interesting and what we will try to explore is that in high dimensions, mean field theory is actually predicting the quantitatively correct behavior. So you could separate these sorts of results into a total fail, in which case mean field theory is predicting a transition that is not there. And a pretty cool success that if we happen to live in four dimensions, we would be very happy. We'd fold up and move on to something else in the class. Unfortunately, we do not. So we can only somewhat celebrate this fact.
All right, so for the next little while, I wanna talk about those aspects that those the physical the physical effects that mean field theory neglects and that of course is the correlations between spins so by replacing that fluctuating field with just a number, while I can kind of approximate the influence on of the field on our tag spin, what I cannot describe is how our tag spin influences that field, which of course, if they were actual spins being represented, it would, it would go both ways. So we can quantify that influence with a correlation function, call it C i and j, which is exactly the statistical influence of the value of spin j, for example, due to spin i. So correlation function is how the fluctuations in spin i are correlated with spin j. If those two variables were independent, c i j would be zero because I could average those fluctuations separately. And by definition, a fluctuation on average is zero. So this function we've defined reports directly on how the average value of spin i is dependent on spin j, or specifically how the fluctuations of spin i are correlated with spin j or vice versa. Okay, so what, would the, what do you think this function looks like? I could put in in the indice for the spins, I could look at spin number one and ask how it's correlated with spin number two or spin number 10. What should it depend on? What should the value of this CIJ depend on? Probably how far I and J are away from each other. If I looked at the fluctuations in a spin in my laptop and ask how correlated it is with a spin in your laptop, that CIJ is probably zero. If I ask for how a spin on one lattice site is correlated with a spin next to it, it's probably non-zero. To understand what this function looks like, it behooves us to first think about limiting cases. So if I is equal to J, so it's the same spin, CIJ is just the average of SI squared less the average of SI quantity squared. SI, of course, can take only two values, zero or one. So the starting point for this correlation function where I look at spins and how they're correlated with themselves is one minus the magnetization squared. That's what, what I mean by little m is the average value of a spin. So I'm taking that value squared. So at temperatures above the critical temperature, Cij will start at one. At temperatures less than the critical temperature where the magnetization is finite, it will be, it will start at something less than one. If T is not equal to the critical temperature, 
as spins get far apart, we should expect, as already alluded to, that I can average those fluctuations separately, that a spin far away from another spin is statistically independent, in which case I'm averaging the fluctuations, which is zero. So as long as there is a distance for which if I look at two spins and they don't influence each other, this correlation length, this correlation function should decay. So putting those two things together, we could plot Cij as a function of call it r i j, the distance between two spins, it's going to start at one minus m squared. It's going to decay to zero as long as we're away from the critical temperature. We don't know exactly what it's gonna look like, but it has to decay. We have reasons to expect that it would do so monotonically. The characteristic scale over which it decays is that correlation length. It tells us over what distances spin i influences spin j. Now, as T approaches TC, the fact that correlation, the fact that we have singular responses implies that, that correlation length must, must diverge. How it diverges however, is universal and does so with its own power law, T minus TC to the nu, where nu turns out to be 0 0.63, at least in three dimensions. So if we were to plot the correlation length, it's a function of temperature, at TC, it's infinite. At very low temperatures, it's small. At very high temperatures, it's small. So very high temperatures, two spins shouldn't care about each other because they temperature, if temperature is lar much, much larger than the exchange interaction, then their statistics are independent of that exchange interaction. So they'll be independent. At very low temperatures, J is very large, so everybody, every, all the spins are doing the same thing, so their fluctuations are very small. Something which is non-trivial is as a consequence of fluctuations of the correlation length diverging, is that fluctuations occur, therefore, on all scales. If there is no characteristic decay of correlations, that means that correlations fluctuations will occur on 
microscopic scales, scales of nanometers, all the way to macroscopic scales, scales of meters. That actually means that near a critical point, you should be able to tell that the system is fluctuating, which is something we normally think we can't observe. You know, we started this class recognizing the fact that diffusion occurs because particles move. We could infer that fluctuations were occurring by the gradual spreading out of ink drop. That doesn't mean that we could visualize what those fluctuations were. Ink in a macroscopic class looks deterministic in its spreading behavior and its diffusion. At a critical point, the fact that molecules are correlated over macroscopic lengths means that we should actually be able to observe those fluctuations. And indeed, there's a phenomena known as critical opalescence. occurring at a liquid vapor transition or a miscibility transition whereby fluctuations become on the same scale as the wavelength of light, thus scattering light, thus becoming opaque. So you could take a molecular fluid, bring it near its critical point, and you'll see that the system magically looks like milk, becomes opaque, scatters light. There's a particularly nice movie of an experiment for CO2, which you can view, in which I will drop in the link for. CO2 happens to have a critical point in its liquid vapor phase diagram, which is close to ambient conditions, making it readily accessible through fairly simple experiments and that experiment is done in this link which is kind of cool in normal times i actually have a lot of fun taking a mixture of toluene and cyclohexane which also has a miscibility critical temperature close to ambient conditions so often i bring in uh, those two liquids into class and show you all that light scattering um, Fortunately, we can't do that this year, but this link will suffice, I think. Okay. So we've now acknowledged correlations exist. They are potentially important because we've missed them in our mean field theory. One way to quantify the importance of, a correlate, of the correlations is to note, is to remind ourselves of the fact that they are directly responsible for the divergence of the susceptibility, something that signals or is the hallmark of a critical point. Okay, so if capital M is the total magnetization of my magnet, the susceptibility is proportional to the fluctuations in capital M divided by the number of spins. The susceptibility, thus something made intensive away from a critical point dropping in that definition of the magnetization as a sum, the susceptibility is proportional to a double sum over indices i and j, average of si, average of sj, less the average of si, the average of sj, it comes from the definition of the fluctuations in the total magnetization. Thus we've found our correlation function the argument of that sum. We've argued that the correlation function should depend on the distance between two spins, not where an individual spin might be. Indeed, for a 
macroscopic solid, it shouldn't matter whether I look at spin one on the left part of the magnet and ask for its correlation function for spins 10 sites away, or if I look at a spin on the right-hand side of the magnet and ask for its correlation function with spin spins 10 lattice sites away. So the origin of the correlation function shouldn't matter just the distance between two spins. Moreover, it shouldn't matter whether I point, if I look at correlations to the left or to the right, the spin, the system should have a rotational symmetry about the lattice. All of this means is that I could sum over different origins of the correlation function, getting rid of one of these sums if they're all statistically the same, then there is n times that individual component, canceling out the n out in front and leaving me with a sum over some tag spin, call it one, and all of the spins it can be correlated with. Now that susceptibility is clearly something which is finite if there are a finite number of terms in that remaining sum, which is to say that Cij is finite only over a certain domain. However, if Cij is finite for all j, so it extends over an entire macroscopic system, then that susceptibility will be infinitely big at least if there are infinitely many spins. So the divergence of chi is directly linked, linked to the decay of Cij. So it will diverge if Cij does not decay. And of course, we're in the thermodynamic limit. This brings up a, a useful note. We know how chi diverges with its own critical exponent, gamma. We know that there is a correlation length in that correlation function that diverges, but with its own critical exponent. Why are those critical, critical exponents different? They are clearly related, but how exactly are they related? Well, if correlations are large, so we're close to the critical point, we could approximate this discrete sum as an integral. We can imagine that Cij is a function of a continuous variable are some difference in where C1 or spin one is and spin J's are. So chi is an equal to constants of a scale. We count those distances on. an integral over where all of these spin j's can be, and a continuous analog of C1j. So that's a form C, R, C of r, that correlation function might depend on dimensionality. It's an integral over an n-dimensional vector r or d-dimensional vector r and this a is the lattice constant of the eisen model 
the distance between two neighboring spins. All right. So as already alluded to, it shouldn't matter which direction we point that vector in, just how far the spins are away from each other. So we can integrate over the angles leaving us with just the radial component, which in D dimensions yields a Jacobian R to the D minus one. Again, this omega is the solid angle in D dimensions for a for three dimensions, spherical harmonics, we have two angles, theta and phi, theta and phi. If I integrate over them, I get a factor of four pi. If I was in two dimensions, I would have a two pi. And you could just, one could work out that solid angle in arbitrary dimensions. I won't prove, but one can demonstrate that that correlation function can be computed in a mean field theory. And it is given by a function which depends on dimensionality of R over the correlation length divided by a power law of R to the D minus two plus eta. So what that function is turns out to be the solution of Poisson's equation in D dimensions. So this is a uh, an exponential, simple exponential in three dimensions. It's a more complicated function in two dimensions. It's a Bessel function in two dimensions, four dimensions has some generalization. But that is what it is. If you want the details of that, we can talk about it in the live session. Otherwise, you know, it's the stuff of 220B. This put together then gives us a chi, which is that solid angle, the lattice constant to the D, an integral from zero to infinity of R to the D minus one, this Y of D and units of the correlation length, R to the D minus two plus eta. I didn't tell you what this eta is, that eta is what is referred to as the anomalous dimension. It tells you about what the correlations look like spatially, how compact they are. So it tells you about the fractal nature of the correlations. Turns out to be a number which is very close to zero in three dimensions, identically zero in four and higher dimensions and somewhat large in two dimensions, a quarter. All right, so what we are trying to do in this calculation is quantify the importance of correlations. This gives us a sense, it tells us that this susceptibility is exactly equal to an integral over the correlations. We want to know, we want a sense for how big that contribution is. And one way to understand that is to note that there's a singular part to the correlation, the correlation function, which is the correlation length. So it behooves us to try to factor out the correlation length dependence. So let's let R be or u be r over the correlation length, such that du is dr over the correlation length. I can thus get chi 
as a solid angle over the lattice constant to the D and I'll get two plus eta factors of the correlation length. I'll have an integral over u now, u to the one plus eta and y d of u. So that is a finite number. Indeed, we find that the susceptibility diverges because the correlation length diverges in a matter that says that it diverges as the square plus this anomalous dimension, thus gamma is equal to twice nu plus that anomalous dimension. In mean field theory, we have no sense of anomalous dimension. We know that gamma is one, so nu in mean field theory is a half. Okay, so this gives us some sense that indeed it's the correlation length which sets the important part of the susceptibility, the divergence part of the susceptibility. We're now in a position where we can go back and ask the question, where are the correlations lost in our mean field theory? Where exactly do we throw them out? Okay, so we're, let's have a slightly more rigorous development of mean field theory. We can do that by first reminding ourselves what the energy function is we're trying to approximate in our Ising model. That's a minus J, the exchange coupling times a restricted sum over SI SJ less H times the sum over SI. Now let's define a fluctuation in the spin i, which is equal to its value less its average. And all the spins are the same, so I don't need to index that average. Now let's try to write that average energy in terms of those fluctuating variables. All right, so if I put in, if I substitute SI is equal to the fluctuations plus their average and put that into the first term, I'll have one piece that gives me minus J double sum M squared. I'll have a minus two J double sum Delta S I M. And finally, a double sum of delta SI, delta SJ. Let's not substitute out that piece. All right. Now let's do something which seems to take a step back if I Resubstitute for this term what I mean by a fluctuation. And reorder. Term 
items like so. I can now group all of the constants. So that first term, m is just a constant. I can take it outside. That will give me n z by two of those terms. The next term has that same constant times two with a minus sign. So that will be adding one of those factors leading me with something overall positive j z n by two m squared. I will also have a j z m plus h times a single sum over si. And finally, a j double restricted sum, fluctuations in si, fluctuations in sj. Noting that this is our h effective, we have just partitioned our energy into a mean field piece, the term we had before, plus this constant we had neglected, and some correction. Let's call this correction delta E. All right, so this is exact. We've just rewritten the energy function into these two terms. We can write down the full system partition function. It will be in the canonical ensemble a sum over all the spins, e to the minus e mean field minus the correction, just putting in what we mean by the energy written in those variables. Let's also define a mean field partition function, which is a sum over spins weighted by just the mean field energy, just that part of the energy. If we multiply top and bottom by that mean field partition function. Like so. We can note that that denominator and that exponential under a sum over states is the averaging operation. That Q mean field in the numerator is a constant. It can be pulled out. So an exact rewriting of the full system partition function is the mean field partition function times an average of that correction evaluated in the mean field system, in a system whose statistics are generated by just the mean field Hamiltonian. And that's great because now one of those terms we know how to evaluate. The mean field partition function is trivial to evaluate because the systems within their mean fields are non-interacting. So the mean field partition function sum over spins, putting in what I mean by the mean field energy, it was some constants. And in addition, the beta H effective times SI. So that piece is a constant. 
sorry. There's a sum. So my work's not completely done, but as a exponential of a sum, that term factorizes. So we can take the constant outside, e to the minus beta jz in m squared by two. It factorizes, so that leaves me with just a single sum. Just n times. So evaluating that sum is easy. There are just two terms. And so what I get is twice this constant factor hyperbolic cosine of beta h effective, all raised to the n, where I can pull that n outside. All right, so we've evaluated the mean field partition function exactly. Which means that we can, for example, compute the free energy within the mean field theory. Because the free energy, for example, the Hemholtz free energy is just minus kBT, the log of that partition function, which is in this case, Jz m squared by two minus kBT log hyperbolic cosine, writing out beta H effective, and a constant minus kb log two. Now this is a free energy which is parametrically dependent on the parameter m. To find what that m should be, we should minimize the free energy. The average value of m, if m is a fluctuating quantity, quantity will be that which minimizes the free energy. And it's easy to find the, the value which minimizes the free energy by finding where its derivative is equal to zero. So taking the derivative, setting it equal to zero, we have zero is equal to jzm, call the point at which m is, min is the minimum of the mean field free energy, m naught. I'll get a minus derivative of kBT log hyperbolic cosine of beta jz m. Well, I'll get a factor of beta, which cancels out the kBT, a factor of, jz. I'll get one over hyperbolic cosine and the derivative of hyperbolic cosine, which is hyperbolic tangent. That ratio is hyperbolic tangent, hyperbolic sine, so in, in that ratio is hyperbolic tangent. canceling out the jz's in both terms and rearranging, we've just found that m naught 
must equal hyperbolic tangent of beta h plus beta j z m naught, which is exactly what we found before. That's the transcendental equation whose solution gives us the value of the average magnetization in mean field theory. It's all consistent. This is just a more rigorous way to derive it because we know exactly the term we've left out. Before we get into that term, let's use this explicit free energy to understand the symmetry breaking in the Ising model a little bit better. So near TC, if H is equal to zero, we expect M to be close to zero, in which case we can get some intuition for what M, the mean field free energy looks like by Taylor expanding that term. So A mean field, divided by n will be approximately the first term minus beta jz squared by two m squared log of hyperbolic cosine is an even function of m plus beta jz to the fourth, that one's to the third, over 12, m to the fourth, minus kbt log two, up to m to the six. If we remember that the mean field critical temperature is jz by kb, we could substitute in mean, the mean field temperature for those values. And to first order in the difference of t less than tc, we would have a mean field by n, so the intensive free energy is Kb by two, T minus Tc, M squared, plus Kb Tc, divided by 12, M to the fourth, neglecting the constants, to first order in T minus Tc. Now, this is a really interesting expression for the free energy. Note that before we made that substitution, we had something that knew about the Ising model we started with. The free energy depended on the value of that exchange coupling, the coordination of the lattice, as well as the order parameter that describes the magnetization transition. Here, the free energy is expressible completely in just the critical temperature and the temperature relative to it and an even series of the order parameter, even reflecting the fact that at H is equal to zero, the system should have an up-down symmetry. The free energy should be a symmetric function of the magnetization. So what's notable about this is that all of those then microscopic details that told us that this was a model for the Ising model or free energy for the, the an approximation of the free energy of the Ising model, all of that detail has completely disappeared. We have something which is a low order expansion in the order parameter for the free energy. 
So indeed, if I didn't tell you what M was, that could be some other order parameter which had a similar up-down symmetry group. So if we moved along the line of symmetry in the lattice gas, we should expect to be able to express the free energy as an expansion analogous to this. Here, instead of M, we would have a expansion in rho, the average occupancy, less its critical value. More than that, this clarifies the temperature dependence associated with spontaneous symmetry breaking. So if I were to plot, that's terrible, the free energy as a function of magnetization, for different temperatures, say T greater than Tc, T less than Tc, or T near Tc. Well, for T greater than Tc, our expression says that that first coefficient in front of the quadratic dependence on M is positive. So locally, I will have something that increases quadratically Eventually, the fourth order term will be important, but that still just monotonically increases the free energy as I increase M. For T is equal to Tc, that first order coefficient goes away. And so I have a quartic increase in the free energy, which means that the fluctuations around m is equal to zero are much, much larger. That indeed reflects the increase in fluctuations upon approaching the critical point. So the flattening out of the free energy, the enabling of large fluctuations because we have a huge density of states around that minima is the mean field way of expressing the divergent susceptibility. Now for T less than Tc, that quadratic coefficient is negative. So that means that for small m, the free energy is a decreasing function of m. The fourth order coefficient is necessarily positive, so it will win at large enough m, meaning that this will turn around. But there you see explicitly that there are two minima in the free energy, one associated with a predominantly spin up state and one associated with a predominantly spin down state. So you see this spontaneous symmetry breaking explicitly. Okay, but this was all still just within mean field theory. So if we now go back to the full partition function, We had an expression that the total system unapproximated partition function was the mean field piece times an average of this correction evaluated in the mean field system, which means that the total free energy is the mean field free energy less KBT log of that correction. Now again, just to be explicit, what that averaging bracket means is that I evolve a mean field system, a system of non-interacting spins, and I average this specific quantity, e to the minus beta delta e, in that system. So it's not that the system changes. It's just that I have identified the 
specific factor that tells me about how the statistics in the mean field system are related to the statistics in the full interacting system. So this is exact, probably however to compute that rightmost piece is just as hard as solving the full Ising model. There's no free lunch. So how might we then try to approximate that, that piece? Well, the simplest thing I can think to do is to imagine that maybe that delta E is small. And thus work out effectively a perturbation theory. Imagine that our mean field theory is close enough to the real answer that delta E is not so big. If delta E is indeed small, then I can expand the exponential. Taylor expansion in the exponential is one minus that small number plus that small number squared divided by two. That's not a full expansion because we can expand the log. The expansion of log of one plus a small number is that small number. So I will get to first order delta E averaged in the mean field theory. And to the second order beta by two, I'll get two terms, a delta E squared and averaged minus delta E averaged and squared. This, of course, is nothing but the fluctuations in delta E. This is, in effect, what is known as free energy perturbation theory. It's taken a reference system that we can imagine we can compute things in and finding low order corrections to it through what is called a cumulant expansion. When I take the log of an exponential average, a Taylor expansion and the argument of that exponential generates the cumulants of that fluctuating quantity. In this case, the correction delta E. All right, let's think about those two terms we've just generated. So the first order piece is delta E averaged in the mean field. Writing that out explicitly, that's minus J double sum average S delta SI delta SJ in the mean field system. In the mean field system, the spins are completely uncorrelated. So that average is uncoupled. I can average SI independently of SJ. The statistics of the spins are independent. That's how I factorized it and solved for that partition function which means that this first order correction is zero. All right. 
right, so that's interesting. The first order correction is zero. The second order correction average of the fluctuations in delta E. Well, that's a variance. That has to be strictly positive. And so A over N must equal A mean field over N to second order minus beta by two, the fluctuations in that quantity divided by N. And so those fluctuations, no reason to expect that they're zero. In fact, they're not. And they're, neg and they're positive, which means that the inclusion of those fluctuations necessarily lowers the free energy. So certainly not something that is expected to be something we can neglect. If you lower the free energy, you make some states more stable. If all it did was raise the free energy, well then relative to the mean field, maybe it's not important. So it's not clear that we can neglect them. The only reason we might be able to is if for some reason that contribution was small. A way to understand whether or not that term is small is to compare a term we've kept to that term, the term that we want to throw out. So the terms we've kept are terms that depend on S averaged and squared. So for mean field theory to be a good approximation, we need the have that that term is much, much larger than the terms we're wanting to throw away, which are the fluctuations in that spin. In order to get a sense of how big these two terms are, we can imagine trying to estimate the size of the fluctuations in the spin by averaging it over a volume set by the correlation length. So that is to say that we can estimate the size of the fluctuations in S as an integral over that correlation function divided by a volume whose domain spans the characteristic length set by that correlation length. So that volume is going to go like the correlation length to the D. We've already demonstrated that this term goes like the correlation length squared in mean field theory, which means that that whole term goes like the correlation length to the two minus D. The correlation length has units of length. Fluctuations in the spins have no units. So I can make this dimensionless by dividing that correlation length
by some typical correlation length, a non-critical length scale in the system, a so-called bare correlation length. a characteristic correlation length of a system away from its critical point. Something that we might expect at for an Ising model to be on the scale of the lattice, for a liquid vapor transition to be on the scale of the molecules, their size. Okay, so that gives us a sense for how the fluctuations in the spins at mean field theory will increase as we approach the critical temperature because we know how the correlation length changes upon approaching the critical temperature. How does the term we've kept increase? Well, average of S quantity squared, that's equal to M squared. M went like T minus TC to the one half, squaring it, that's T minus TC. That is inversely proportional to the temperature dependence of the correlation length squared. So, the scaling relationship is that this size of the average squared goes like C inverse N squared. So for mean field theory to be accurate, We require the average of S, <coughs> yeah, excuse me, quantity squared is much, much greater than average of the fluctuations in S squared. We've just noted the scaling relationship for the left hand side. Let's write it in terms of its bare correlation length. There is some constant of proportionality for all of this, call it B. And the fluctuations went like correlation length to the two minus D. Making it dimensionless by multiplying by it, it's bare correlation length. And this B is some finite constant root three or so, factors of the solid angle. Rearranging, we require that the correlation length to the D minus four is greater than this positive constant B divided by the bare correlation length to the four minus D. Now look at that, for self-consistency, for the terms we've kept to be large compared to the terms we've thrown away, we require that the correlation length to the power d minus four is much, much greater than some positive constant. We don't know what that constant is. We could work it out should we really want it, but what's important is as T goes to TC, we know that that correlation length diverges. And if D is greater than four, that condition will always be satisfied because we will have on the left-hand side, 
something that goes like one over the correlation length and the correlation length. Hmm. Sorry, that goes like the correlation length to some power. That correlation length diverges. So whatever that power is, as long as it's positive, which we've just shown it will be, that inequality will be valid. It will, it becomes infinity. So infinity is always greater than some finite number. So what has just popped out is that depending on the dimensionality, whether it's greater than four or less than four, we will find that this inequality is either always satisfied close enough to the critical point or never satisfied. So that is in fact why the critical exponents for four and five dimensions in all higher dimensions are well predicted by mean field theory because the even though the correlation length diverges the averages due to that are incorporated into the fluctuations that are incorporated into mean field theory the self averages went out they become larger in magnitude, their fluctuations become larger in magnitude faster than the correlated part of the fluctuations. By contrast, for d less than four, the correlated part always grows faster than the non-correlated part. The fluctuations, the terms that we've missed due to spins interacting with each other, dominate the averages. One can define a temperature at which the left and right hand side are equal. Let's call that T sub G. That temperature is known as the Ginsberg temperature. and tells you where you start seeing deviations away from mean field theory exponents, where non-mean field behavior is going to dominate. That temperature relative to the critical temperature is determined by things like constants like the solid angle, things that are in B, but also the bare correlation length. And because it goes inverse to the bare correlation length, if systems have naturally large correlations, you will require temperatures closer to the critical temperature to see deviations from mean field theory. For something like a liquid vapor transition where bare correlations on the scale of molecular sizes, those deviations show up very quickly because there's a big range of length scales between the molecular diameters on the scales of angstroms and the hundreds of nanometers or meters that result in macroscopic correlations. But for something like a superconductivity transition where the bare correlation length is already very large. It's called the coherence length. It's something that exists on tens of nanometers. Mean field theory works to very close to the critical temperature, so close that it becomes hard to actually measure deviations from mean field theory. All right, so this is explained why four and higher dimensions are special. It's also told us that we will never win by taking mean field theory as a reference for three and lower dimensions. That fluctuations are always going to be important and non-perturbatively so. So we'll have to come up with a different scheme to try to do better. So that will be the subject of next week's lectures.
So t stay tuned for all of that. Um, I will post the practice midterm shortly. And so uh, I'll look forward to seeing you all in the live session.